Hey everyone, I wanted to make a video on George Asawa's birth chart. Um, again, I don't have his birth time, but uh, you know, I have a lot of information to go by anyway. So uh, I have the, the birth, birth date at um, October 18th, 1893, and just set it to 12 p.m. So the houses are not correct. And the place doesn't matter either. This is just about the planets in the sky um, at that time. So let's see, this is his natal chart. Uh, we can see a big cluster of planets over here. Sun is in Libra. Um, just one interesting thing about Sun in Libra. Sun is exalted in Aries. It rules Leo, um, and it's uh, debilitated in, in Libra. Uh, just some thoughts about that. Well, Libra is the seventh sign, and, and number seven, uh, as you may know, is a, has a particular frequency. So these, these archetypes of the signs, they definitely relate to their, their number correlation. Um, each number has a resonance, a frequency, uh, you know, and we know that based in, you know, polarities, especially with George Asawa's teachings of yin and yang, that that's a number two frequency. And each number has its own uh, meaning, its own resonance. So number seven, has a very special meaning and frequency. What number seven is, is um, think about the correlations. You know, we have seven days a week and go back to the original um, story behind that. God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested, right? Um, number seven is a prime number. We have seven chakras, uh, seven, uh, there's George Sal created the seven levels of judgment and all throughout, you know, the world's cultures, we can find the number seven repeating again and again and again, and it relates to a very kind of perfect, harmonious, balanced, uh, restful number, nature. Uh, number seven is right before Scorpio. And if you know astrology, Scorpio is number eight. Uh, Scorpio is the sign of crisis, of death and rebirth of a deep struggle and pain. Scorpio is not an easy sign. Anyone with strong Scorpio nature goes through tremendous amount of hardship, but they, they, they come out with great depth at the same time. And if you look at number eight, there's a strong correlation there too, because eight is not a prime number. Eight breaks down into four and then four sets of two. So eight is constantly crumbling and building itself back up, just the very nature of the numbers. You can get a lot just by looking at the numbers versus seven, it's very stable. It's a prime number, it doesn't break down. It holds itself together. And the symbol of uh, seven uh, is, is Libra. Libra is the scales of balance, of harmony, of equality, right? It's a resting, stable, balanced number. And why? is the sun debilitated in Libra? Well, the sun is the ego. The sun is the personality. But Libra is not a sign that really enhances the personality. The sun doesn't do well in Libra because it's a, a sign of rest. And the sun doesn't want to rest. The sun wants to shine. The sun likes more active numbers. It likes Aries, number one. Leo, number five. Um, any of the fire signs, um, even Sagittarius, number nine, uh, or the air signs, you know, or well, not not uh, uh, Libra's obviously an air sign, but you know, any other sign is 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 fine except for um, Libra. Also, you know, Aquarius, I guess, would be opposite Leo, so it doesn't shine as well in in that sign, but. Um, you know, Libra in particular. Um, so that's interesting. Anyway, so ego, but the sun isn't everything because sun is ego and personality. So ego is and personality are not well accented 
and, and uh, draw the solid sign. That's the first thing to know in, in his chart. Second thing is that his sun is next to conjunct south node. And what south node represents is the past. It represents what we came into this world with, but that we're not moving towards. It's not our destiny. Our destiny is found in our north node. So people with sun and south node, they, they kind of don't, they have a detachment towards themselves, towards their personality. They don't care that much for their, for, they care about other things besides themselves, besides their ego. In a sense, it can be a, a, a spiritual placement. At, at worst, it can be a, a, the sign of somebody who just doesn't care about themselves, you know, in a negative way, in a destructive way. Um, but it's not only the sun that he has conjunct the south node, he has Saturn conjunct the south node. And Saturn is the planet of restriction. It's a very young planet. It's, I mean, you know, and we, you know, I'm going to describe things that the very much um, carve out George Asawa as we know him. Saturn is the planet of restriction. It's the planet of limitations. It's the planet of discipline, of authority, of paring things down to their essential nature. It's not a bad planet. To, you know, it's just not an easy planet. And anyone with South Node conjunct Saturn came into this world with so much discipline. You know, and they have to learn it through their through their youth. When, whatever we uh, have south node conjunct or in the sign, we learn that in our youth. We relive that. So you can see that in the stories when he was young. He had tremendous difficulty, you know, with his family dying and sickness, tuberculosis, and healing himself. That's all south node Saturn and sun. Um, and Saturn is conjunct Juno. Juno is the um, asteroid of marriage, indicates marriage. So there's a tremendous commitment that he already had. He's, he was married to Saturn, essentially, you could say. Married to contraction, married to this very strict, disciplined, young kind of way. Um, and Mars is here too. This is called a stellium. When, when you have three or more planets or points in a sign, they're all in Libra. Um, again, Mars does not do on Libra because Mars rules Aries. But um, for the same reason, because Mars has an affinity with the sun. Mars is like the, Mars is almost like a mini sun. They both deal with will and passion and vitality. Uh, they're both masculine planets. In fact, so is Saturn. Um, and, you know, Mars and Sun do well in the same signs. Uh, so Mars does not do well in Libra either. Uh, it's just too restful for Libra. It's too neutral uh, for Mars. But Mars is strengthened greatly by Saturn because Mars is um, exalted in Capricorn and Saturn rules Capricorn. So Mars always benefits from being close to Cap Saturn. And I forgot to mention, Saturn is exalted in Libra which is you may not think that but it is and why why is that because well saturn is different than sun and mars in that saturn does not like to shine saturn likes to be inward saturn is even more like sun and mars are are, are extroverted they have an extroverted nature but libra actually wants to go inward and be quiet and saturn likes that saturn also deals with the law and so does libra so Saturn's law can be really strong in Libra. It, it, it just, they, they, Saturn is an inward kind of young where Mars and Sun are an outward kind of young. So uh, it, this is a harmonious yin yang combination, Saturn and Libra. So Saturn is greatly strengthening Mars here. It's uh, Mars and Saturn have a certain kind of affinity where Mars is like the, one analogy would be like a soldier and Saturn is like the general. So like Mars gets training from Saturn. It's not, you know, like a wild animal anymore. Mars is trained. It's like a trained soldier, a trained, um, you know, warrior, you know, even far more, far more capable 
You know, he's not, this kind of Mars is not going to lash out like wildly, like just uncontrollably. He's going to be trained and he's going to be quiet when he needs to be quiet and he's going to be controlled when he needs to be controlled. And then when the time is right, he'll act. You know, that's what Saturn does for Mars. It controls Mars. Um, it's a very strong young combination. I know I have it also not as tightly um, as Georgia Sawa, but here we can see like generally, like why, why was Georgia Sawa so strong? Like, like this physical kind of strong, like this personality so young, so contracted, and he was an action oriented person, right? You know, he had traveled around the world in poverty and spoke out and all this, he was very action oriented um, compared to a lot of people. Like he really had this ability to, to, to have this courage, tremendous will and courage that we all see, see right here. Um, close by Mercury and Uranus conjunct in Scorpio. Uh, Uranus is exalted in Scorpio. And Mercury is just very deep in Scorpio. Scorpio is water um, and death and secrecy and cult. So this combination is, is a certain kind of brilliance, a very kind of, because Uranus represents, it's the planet of enlightenment, of awakening. It, it gets the most brilliant ideas, inventive ideas. Like it's just like lightning, you know, shooting into his intellect. Your, Mercury represents the lower mind. Uh, so it's very powerful, you know, like phew, new ideas, like, wow, I'm just, you know, like, wow, I just invented something completely new, you know, very strong, very deep, like, you know, like deep hidden knowledge, secrets, Scorpio represents secrets, um, the occult, understanding like the most deep things, you know, so he had this great ability to understand um, things, new things, because Uranus can just invent new things. Um, and it's tightly, um, there's a tight in conjunction between Pluto and Neptune, which are conjunct in Gemini. Now this is a generational aspect. These are very slow outer moving planets. Um, and this combination happened for a lot of people in that time period in in 1893, some very powerful people and some uh, some not so good people. Hitler was born during this time period, so it was Charlie Chaplin, but also Yogananda and Krishnamurti. So it depends how it's aspected. It can go either way. Um, Pluto is very transformative. It's the most outward planet. It transforms things. It can destroy things. It rules Scorpio, one of the sub rulers of Scorpio but it can create as well. It transforms, it evolves. Scorpio's nature one, wants to evolve. It wants to evolve whatever it touches. Neptune is the second most outer planet and it's actually a real planet. Pluto's, um, I, I can't remember the classification, but they demoted it into, it's not a whole, it's not a, it's like a sub micro planet. I can't remember what they call it. It's not a full planet, but Neptune is. Neptune represents our highest, um, vision, dreams, spirituality, um, psychic ability, uh, just, uh, it can also rule delusions and an in, uh, inability to control oneself and loss and drugs and alcohol, but it depends on the person. It depends how it's aspected and it depends on the whole thing, whether somebody's asked, you know, um, uh, reaching the higher potential or the lower potential. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, as we can see, like with somebody with Hitler, like Hitler, you know, who, who definitely um, utilized the lower aspect of this and other, other people as well. Um, but the in conjunction is a 512 aspect. We know that because same number, like 10, 10, and then 12 signs. So one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, yeah, it's, it's not six twelve. Six twelve will be here. Five twelve. Um, so, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Um, the twelfth, twelfth harmonic. Um, five twelfths would mean five. Five is creative, and twelve is spiritual. 
so especially with these outer planets which are more spiritual in nature it's it's not a it's not a difficult aspect with mercury it is it's a difficult aspect and and mercury in conjunct neptune can create a lot of delusions um it can create you know just fantasy thinking like uh dishonesty and and um even craziness a certain kind of just like believing in delusional things thinking but why do i think george sawa did uh transcended that because first of all all difficult aspects represent soul lessons that we have to learn in this life either something that we will um not fully learn or something that we will learn and that uh the difficult aspect can become an asset as we age um and I think George Asawa mastered this uh, connection because um, Neptune is a very Ian planet. It's very expansive. It has no boundaries. It has no borders. It's like the ocean. You just get lost. It's a planet of loss. And he was so young. So with each of these planets and aspects, we can look and, and see how to harmonize them and how to grow and learn because they're, these all represent lessons, soul lessons that we have to learn. So through macrobiotics, he was able to balance this. That's why he was, he was not delusional. Neptune to Mercury here, because he mastered this connection, was created great vision, which he had, right? And it's connected to Uranus. So this, this, these are connected. Um, his, his brilliant inventiveness with tied to great vision and transformation. Pluto wants to transform and evolve. So he's transforming his mind into this great big thinking ability. Um, you know, macrobiotics. All right. Um, so there's a square to Chiron. Chiron deals with wounds and healing, both. Lower aspect is, is wounds, higher aspect is healing. And the square represents difficulty and challenge. And again, he was sick when he was young. And Pluto is transformative. Pluto to Chiron is, is, is deeply painful, although it's a wide orb. Neptune to Chiron shows some loss, some very painful loss. And we know that when he, when he was young, that's what happened. He was sick and he lost his family and he was alone and, and he had to heal himself by you know, eating the discarded vegetables from, you know, the trash can from restaurants or, or whatever in Japan. And he, and he did. Um, and, and Chiron's higher aspect is, is healing, being a healer. So again, this is connecting to, to this, this, um, this grouping of Pluto, Neptune, Mercury, and Uranus um, harmoniously here, challenged square here. Um, so it's tying in healing ability, um, especially as he got older. All right. Um, so some of these aspects are not very strong, so I'm not going to spend much time going over them. Jupiter to Ceres. Ceres, um, again, is the root of cereal. Ceres is Demeter, um, the goddess of agriculture. So she deals with food. And on the positive side, on the negative side, it could be food restriction, but this is a tight square to Jupiter. But again, um, that is, squares are also motivating, deeply motivating. Jupiter's teaching uh, ability, wisdom, philosophy, guru. So food philosophy, I mean, that's very clear here. Mo mo very motivated food philosophy. Um, the square could represent some, um, overly restrictive quality that he had with food because in the mythology series dried up the land when she lost her daughter um, and allowed no food to be grown. So there's some association negatively with um, over too much food restriction. Uh, for some people, series can represent uh, eating disorders. But here I think um, it, it, it shows um, his ability to restrict food for his benefit um, and health. 
because he obviously did not have an eating disorder. He definitely dealt with food in a very restrictive way and taught about food in a restrictive way. We know that because the tight conjunction, it's a tight square, it's zero, uh, 14 minutes, zero, nine minutes. So the, the tighter the aspect, the more significant it is. So this is a significant aspect. Okay. Um, moon square sun shows an inner tension between his personality and his his emotional his deep inner emotional life and um it's it's just very motivating as well um driving all these difficult aspects they you know as long as we're not resigned and destroy ourselves you know just some people have difficult aspects and they just resign to life and they kill themselves basically as long as we're not resigned to life and we're, we're proactive within our life, squares and difficult aspects just push us to achieve more. So this is some, it just shows a, like an inner tension like between his emotional nature and his um, outer ego personality. Um, yeah. What else is interesting is that if we look at north node south node axis the north node and south node are always the same exact degrees opposite each other and they're the north and south node of the moon they represent eclipse points from the moon um, like when the moon moves over the sun we have an eclipse um, or we have a lunar eclipse when the the shadow of the when the earth's shadow falls on the moon the moon gets blocked out. It's also eclipse. These are eclipse points. And what they represent is a kind of destiny. So South Node represents the past. It represents karmically what we already came into this life with, the skills, the lessons, and the um, everything that, that we've already learned up until this point. So we're very familiar with everything that's connected to our south node. That's why he was so disciplined, George Sawa. I mean, astrology is amazing. It's just all very clearly written here. South node Saturn, you know, conjunct uh, Sun and, and Mars and Juno. Uh, it couldn't be more clear. Like he was just so confident and disciplined and strong. And his destiny, look, I mean, just look at the patterns here. All these planets are, are, are uh, you know, um, over here. And the North Node, his destiny is over here, all alone. Well, what, what happened in his life? You know, he, he left Japan. He left his family. He lost his family. He left everyone. And he went out on his own. Aries is the first sign. Aries represents the self, the individual. Um, this clearly shows a destiny away from everything that he knew, his past. And that's exactly what happened, both physically and ideologically. He started something new, macrobiotics. Yeah, I, I mean, this is amazing. It's so clear. And the reason I know it's like this is because if, if I pulled up Genghis Khan's chart. I've seen Genghis Khan's chart. It's almost similar. Is it? In fact, Genghis Khan's chart is even more dramatic. He has everything right around his south node and his north node is just here out in the middle of nowhere with nothing. And that was Genghis Khan's life. He, he went out on his you know, own to new worlds. You know, he had an army to, with him, but he was the leader. And, you know, he conquered. You know, and George Sawa has a similar kind of thing going on where he just went out and ventured into this foreign world, uh, you know, with virtually nobody. I mean, him, him and his wife, Lima. And, you know, he went to Africa, he went to Europe, and he just conquered ideologically with, with macrobiotics. Like he's just spread this new awareness that we know about um, as macrobiotics. Uh, so it, to me, it's, I mean, it's absolutely amazing how clear all this is. All right. And just, uh, let's see. Yeah. I mean, that's not a very 
prominent aspect palace to Mercury. Um, now, one more thing. Well, actually a number of things, but here's the next thing. This is out of, it talks about, points to its out of balance planets, the declination. And what that means is that the sun moves in a wave pattern up and down um, its, its path, which we call the ecliptic, and it moves to 23 degrees and I think 27 minutes up and down. So any, and the planets follow that line, that general line, they move up and down along with it. And any planet that goes outside of uh, 23 degrees, I'm not sure if it's 27 or 17, anyway, some minutes, I can't remember exactly, is considered out of bounds. And what an out of bounds planet is, it's like um, just exactly like it sounds. It, it's, it's, it's a planet, it represents a planet that's just out of the norm, out of range of normality. It goes to extremes. And so we see his moon is out of bounds. And uh, a lot of people who, who, are, who are brilliant, who, do, who are brilliant or who do brilliant new things or who do things that, in unusual new ways have out of bounds planets. Moon being one of the prominent ones, sun will never be out of bounds. So we can't have an out of bounds sun, but we can have an out of bounds moon. Um, and moon represents our deep inner personal nature. Um, it can have positive and negative associations. It's not good. It's not bad either. One of the negative things about out of bounds moon is that because moon represents our deep personal, um, emotional, you know, inner nature, um, these people can be very cold and hard, even cruel at times, cruel to themselves as well. And we know how restrictive and young he was and how much he could tolerate. He just had this incredible tolerance for, for uh, you know, pain and hardship and difficulty. That's his out of bounds moon. Somebody with an imbalanced moon does not have that ability to, to tolerate that. Um, they just wouldn't. And at the same token, they wouldn't uh, tolerate it with anyone else. They wouldn't be so, they won't be so cool, cruel or cold or hard with other people, but they may not be the people who to do these, these incredible new things. So, you know, it's always a sacrifice you get, it's both. So, you know, he may have been very cold and hard, but he did some incredible things with his out of bound moon, made him brilliant in a certain way and very extreme, right? Um, Venus, again, I'm not sure of the minutes, so Venus is right on the border, maybe out of bounds a little bit, or might not be. Uh, Venus represents our beauty, our attraction to beauty, our sense of beauty, our, um, it also deals with romance and leisure and joy, but he was very uh, attuned to beauty and a very, had a very refined sense of beauty. And there's other things that point to that as well, but it was right on the limit. And that's the only, those are the only two planets that um, are out of bounds or close to out of bounds. Um, Let's look at his midpoint structures. Uh, I pulled up some things already. Uh, midpoint structures um, show a certain resonance because if you have two planets that are uh, that have a midpoint, um, and there's another planet in that midpoint, then there are three planets. They resonate. It's like a beat, a rhythm. You know, like music. It it creates a harmony. And this is called um, uh, harmonic astrology or uh, vibrational astrology. Um, it, it deals with th this kind of rhythm, these patterns, and it, um, it's very closely related to, uh, you know, macrobiotic thinking with dialectic and yin yang and resonance and five transformations. So that's why I like it. So I'm not going to go through all of these. We're just going to look at the really strong ones. Um, oppositions and conjunctions. So sun, moon, opposition, Pluto, that means the midpoint of sun, moon, Pluto is exactly opposite by 15 minutes. So Pluto transforms. So this is very clear, this is what I'm gonna talk about. Pluto transforms whatever it touches. So Pluto is as being aspected strongly by sun and moon. That means Pluto is transforming his sun and moon. And we know that happened. We know he went through deep transformational changes throughout his life. Uh, through difficulty, through hardship, through crisis, and came out on top. 
So Pluto transformed his sun and moon, his, the, the bulk of his personality, his defining qualities. Sun, Mars conjunct Saturn, and I just want to show you what that looks like. Sun, Mars, midpoint, Saturn. Now we could do the math and look at the degrees because it's just math, but you know, find out the middle point, Saturn is right there. What that means is Saturn's aspect, that Saturn is, is like, like pressured by the qualities of Sun and Mars. And so it gives Saturn extra energy. Um, and Sun and Mars relate to will. They relate to passion and drive. And, and this is just strengthening his, his Saturnian qualities. It just makes him that much more young. And he was, I mean, he was just the definition of young, the definition of this kind of strength of will and structure and orderliness. You can see that very clearly with, with these uh, midpoint structures. Um, moon, Saturn, Venus. Let's look at that one. Moon, Saturn, Venus. Venus is right in the middle. The moon is Saturn. Uh, moon, the emotional heart, the personal, deeply personal inner mind. Venus, sense of beauty, creativity, aesthetics. Saturn, very refined. refined. When Saturn touches the um, moon or Venus or any of the Ian planet, it just refines them. So he had a very, what this is saying is his emotional sense of beauty was was very refined and it was like he had a great appreciation for the arts for poetry and you can see that in his writing i mean so i mean he was a poet essentially he was an artist and he had so much appreciation for it he had a very refined sense of beauty a very well developed sense of beauty of art um some of these we're going to ignore because we don't know the houses. MC deals with the houses. Um, Venus, Saturn, Mercury. Venus, Saturn, Mercury. Mercury, sorry, Mercury. And that's just, I, you know, I think that has to do with his writing. He wrote so much. And Venus, Venus and Mercury together create great writing ability. And Saturn just makes it very, um, Saturn indoors, so wherever Saturn is, there's, um, it can be long. Saturn makes things long. So long writing, beautiful. Venus, um, Mercury together are, are great at writing, great at communicating in general, but I think more writing with, with Saturn because it's re refining it you know, making it more crystal, crystallized and, and um, uh, pointed, just structured. So it, it relates more to writing, I think. And we see that here. All right. Let's see if there's any more. Mars, Uranus, Sun. Yeah, this is a good one. Mars, Uranus, Sun. Sun doesn't look like it's in the middle, but if you do the math, it is. It's right. It's about 15 degrees from Mars and 15 degrees from Uranus. And Mars and Uranus together are very inspirational, right? Because Mars is passion and drive and will. And Uranus is kind of like this lightning, this thunder, this brilliance. And together, they, they just create this exuberance, this excitability, this, this great passionate inspiration and right into his son, his, the main personality, whatever hits the sun shines on everything. And this shows that he was a man of inspiration and a totally inspired man. And we know that when you read his writing, it was, it was just, you feel the inspiration. You feel this, this, this Trinity of these three, the, just so much inspiration. And like, it, he just inspired people. Like you get chills when you read his writing by how inspiring he was. So again, the, these midpoint structures really, really show a lot of detail about a person. You can learn so much from them. Um, 
you start to really see the person come alive. It's like you're, you're chipping away at a, at a sculpture, like a block of wood or something, and you're getting all the details with these midpoint structures that make the person come alive. Here we have one, uh, Jupiter, Neptune, opposite Venus. Jupiter, Neptune, opposite Venus. Um, again, Jupiter, teaching, uh, wisdom, guru, Neptune, dream, vision. Um, Venus is, is beauty, art. So he had this ability to, to convey something very beautiful through his vision and through his teaching and through his higher mind, through his philosophy. And macrobiotics is here. We see that. Jupiter's philosophy and Neptune is, is vision. And there's a, his ability to write and his ability to convey these beautiful high-minded things very present here all right that might that might be it uh for the midpoints yeah i'm not going to go through all of these because some of these are not relevant um all right the next thing i wanted to go through to point out is harmonic charts and what are harmonic charts? Again, these are numbers. This all, this all has to deal with numbers. We have the 12 signs. Each sign has a number, one, two, three. They each mean something. The houses each mean something, even though we don't have houses here. Uh, the aspects mean something. The, the trine is a three aspect. The opposition is a two aspect. Conjunction is a one aspect. Um, square is a four aspect. And when we get into the higher aspects, this is, you know, these, these dotted lines are a five twelfths aspect. Um, this is a sextile, it's a six aspect. Um, they all mean something, but some of them we can't see easily here, so we have to pull up a separate chart. This is a fifth harmonic aspect. It relates to number five. So what are the qualities of number five? Uh, well, in astrology, five is the, the fifth sign, Leo, ruled by the sun, uh, fifth house, it relates to creativity, to play, to this kind of outgoing, bright, playful, creative, exuberant, you know, quality. All right. So here, obviously, we have this, this nice triangle here. It's in water. Um, and it's called the Grand Trine. We have Pluto, Mars, and Chiron. Um, Okay, just, you know, this is, Chiron deals with healing. It deals with wounds and healing. And Pluto's transformation, Mars' is will, Pluto and, and Mars together create this tremendous kind of will, this deep, passionate will of force to, to heal. And that's, again, that's what he did, creative healing. And there's a spiritual element too, because it's all in water. So this is uh, pointing to his, his, he, the healing ability, the, the path that, you know, he healed himself, but he also healed the world. I mean, he healed so many people with macrobiotics. So it's very strong with this, you know, in this creative sign of the, the fifth, fifth harmonic. Very evident here. Um, and North Node's pretty close. Um, we can use wider orbs in the harmonic charts because they're magnifications of the natal chart. So up to 16 degrees usually is acceptable. Um, and what else? Um, you know, Sun conjunct Jupiter. Again, that's very um, telling, of, you know, Jupiter is the guru, the teacher, the wisdom, the great benefic. Um, yeah, let's let's look at the other ones. Um, I mean, okay, this is the ninth harmonic, and just look at the harmony here. It's really nice, really nicely laid out. Harmo uh, a ninth harmonic chart. Ninth is the most. This is the most um, second most important chart in Vedic astrology because it's uh, ninth. It's just a very complete number. 
It, it deals with um, the ninth house or a, a Sagittarius. Um, and it's the third fire sign. So the three fire signs are one, five, and nine. One is the self, five is the, the sun, and nine is the, the, the greater self. They all have to deal with the self in essence, but this is self in relation to others. Self, is so this deals with marriage, but also family and community. So the reason this is important because um, this kind of relates to his um, relation to the whole world in a sense. His, it has a very spiritual component, but it's also the, um, how he relates to the whole world how he relates to macrobiotics, how he relates to the macrobiotic community at large. So first thing we can see the harmony in this chart, you know, the trine and then this, um, what's it called? I can't remember the shape. It's a, this nice, nice, beautiful shape here. We'll just say that. Um, Venus, Neptune, and look at this tight conjunction, uh, Jupiter and Uranus. Um, Jupiter and Uranus, again, philosophy, very inspired philosophical, inspired philosophy, um, beautiful and dream, big vision, right? We can see macrobiotics very clearly represented here. And, um, Saturn, Pluto, Ceres, again, Jupiter and Uranus and Venus on this side. Again, just we can see the harmony represented here. Um, Pluto's transforming Ceres has to do with agriculture, food related, transforming food. Again, this is, has to deal with the, the world, how he relates to his larger, larger community. So we can see themes, you know, coming together. Um, again, just beautiful vision. Um, just this harmonious Saturn and Jupiter are connecting here. <clears throat> with Uranus. Gosh, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's a nice, a nice representation of, of something very harmonious in the ninth harmonic. Difficult to, to put it all into words, I guess. That's what I'm trying to say. Here we have the 12th harmonic and 12 deals with um, this 12 signs. So 12 represents Pisces. It, it shows a very spiritual quality uh, to, you know, in this harmonic. Um, it's not an easy um, harmonic because 12 represents the finality of, of loss of, of, um, Disillusion, uh, dis dissolve, dissolving, boundarylessness. So there's some, you know, with the twelfth twelfth aspect, it's not easy, but it it shows very very spiritual and and big vision, dream kind of component. Um, but again, we see this this really nice harmony here, uh, showing that um, you know there's some very strong spiritual elements in his life. Whenever you have the grand, a grand shrine, it's showing a very, very harmonious quality to it because trines are, are all in the same element. They just relate. They just show like a certain kind of brilliance and ease to them. And we have something very um, emotional and beautiful here. Remember, uh, there was also the connection before with the, the Saturn, Venus, Moon, and the midpoint structures. It shows great 
artistic sensibility, very refined sense of, of beauty and artist artistry in, in, a, in a deep spiritual way. Um, Jupiter and Ceres here, um, Ceres relating to food, Jupiter relating to, to teaching, to philosophy, tied to his son, the main, you know, his personality. Um, and then Pallas is playing in here really strongly. Pallas relates to, again, a kind of wisdom and pattern recognition, like diagnosis, macrobiotic diagnosis. It's a, it's a, it's a very, it's an asteroid, but it right, relates to some just very um, well-rounded positive mental attributes of pattern recognition, of wisdom, of justice. Um, Uranus, Mars, and Pluto, deeply inspiring and transformational here. Pluto's a little farther out, but at least we get the, the again, the, the sun, Uranus, Mars, so much the deeply inspiring quality to it. And that's trining the Jupiter in Ceres, so reflecting his teaching ability and his spiritual sensibilities. Um, so, I mean, you know, some people say like when you look up these harmonic charts that they don't mean as much and it's just cherry picking and all, but actually you don't see these, these beautiful shapes with most people or in all these different, these significant charts. The charts I showed you are the, um, they're, they're powerful. They're, you, you just know by the number, number five, number nine, nine, nine star key, remember, and uh, number 12. These are all very strong numbers. And I left some out because they weren't as relevant. You know, seven and you know, 11, they'll show up in different people's charts more strongly, you know, depending on, on their personality, their nature. <clears throat> right? So these, these are the numbers that are resonating with George Asawa very strongly. One, five, uh, nine, and 12. Uh, and it's different from other people like Michio Kushi, or I could do others and I, I probably will do others. So again, this is George Asawa. I, I think when I put these all together, it really, um, it's like painting a picture. You get to see George Asawa through all these different um, elements when, when you put them all together. You know, one alone, just, it's really hard. Like if it was just doing the natal chart, yeah, you get, you, you squint, you could see, <clears throat> Jordan but anyone born during this day is going to have a similar chart. And that's why um, it really gets down to the details, the, the fine details. The moon moves, um, what, changes sign every two and a half days. Um, the houses would really bring in another element altogether, a deeply personal element, because the, the, they change even more quickly. But, um, you know, we're getting a very strong picture of George Sala by, by all these. So, all right, guys, um, if you want a reading from me, uh, reach out to me my, at my email or on Facebook. Uh, my email is macrogoldmachine at yahoo.com. Uh, just feel free to email me, but only if you want a reading um, or you, if you have a relevant question. Um, otherwise, thanks a lot. And yeah, thanks for watching.